Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the, uh, Luis Zingales. I'm the academic director of the Stiegler Center, and I'm very happy to present uh, this Stiegler event, this very special Stiegler event, um, that uh, will start with uh, first, uh, um, actually, let me describe uh, why we did this, this Stiegler event, because uh, we want to present a new series of uh, case studies uh, launched by Stiegler, and the first one will be dedicated to Mediapart, um, a very successful uh, investigative journalist uh, uh, outlet that uh, has uh, gained international uh, importance of reputation. And uh, now we have a case available on Mediapart with uh, also teaching note available for those of you who want to teach it, uh, produced by uh, Guy Rolnick, who is co-director of the Stigler Center. And, um, we are very pleased today to have uh, Edoui Plenel, who is the editor-in-chief of Mediapart, um, and uh, his co-founder, Marie-Hélène... Uh, Smiejon. Smiejon. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then Jim uh, Hamilton, that's much easier to pronounce, the Hearst Professor of Communication and Director of a Journalist Program at Stanford. Uh, Jay has uh, written a, a, a book, uh, actually has written several books, but one just came out is Democracy's Detective, um, that examines the economics of investigative journalists. And so is a very appropriate uh, uh, match between sort of uh, the experience of Mediapart and uh, the academic study by Gene Hamilton. So we'll start with a presentation by Jay, and then uh, we're going to have a panel discussion to address the question, uh, is there a viable business model for media outlets to conduct investigative journalism? And is financial investigative journalism a service that can be produced by the market, or is it a public good? And uh, before I let the floor to Jim, let me remind you that our next event uh, is a mini course uh, of uh, two lectures uh, from the very exciting title of Trump and Trade, uh, taught by Professor Douglas Irving of uh, Dartmouth College. The lecture will take place uh, from uh, 12 to 1 on April 24th and 25th, and registration are open, so go and visit on the uh, Stiegler uh, website where you can register for the event. And uh, uh, just as a reminder to all of, uh, of you, this is uh, a lively stream, uh, so be careful what you say. Uh, Gene, the floor is yours. That's a great, oh, great note to start on. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here. When I was a graduate student in economics in the 1980s, I read uh, George Stigler's uh, article, 1961, about the economics of information. And it was really the first thing that I'd ever read that treated information as a product in a supply and demand framework. I was also very influenced by Ronald Coase's 1960 Journal of Law and Economics uh, article, The Problem of Social Cost that deals with externalities. And really, my work as an economist is focused on information and externalities. That led me to write a book called All the News That's Fit to Sell, How the Market Transforms Information into News, which basically looks at the market for public affairs information. That book led me to be hired by the FCC to work on a project called the Working Group on Community Information Needs. And that produced, in 2011, a report that was 400 pages, and it had the word market failure in it once, in a footnote, because they forgot to take it out. Because what I found in working with the FCC is that they were willing to accept the logic of market failure, some of them were, but they didn't want to use the term because that might imply government action. And there were a set of people at the FCC that I worked with who actually believed uh, that there's nothing special about media markets, that the public interest is defined by the public's interest, that TV is just a toaster with pictures. That was a famous quote from the FCC chairman in the 1980s. And that what we're seeing, the changes that we're seeing in media markets is simply creative disruption. And that it's actually a good thing that the gatekeepers are going away. I take a different view of media markets. I think that some types of information is subject to the market failure of public goods, positive externalities. So I set out to write a book called Democracy's Detectives, in which I would try to provide empirical evidence for the positive externalities uh, that are involved with investigative reporting. 
And my one sentence summary of that book is that investigative reporting is underprovided in the market today, but new combinations of data and algorithms may lower the cost of how we discover stories and allow us to tell stories in more personalized or engaging ways. That sentence took me four years to uh, develop, and so what I want to do briefly today is explain to you how I got to that sentence. Uh, a brief recap of the economics of information. How many of you have had microeconomics? You're my people. Uh, <laughs> when I usually give this talk, it's at journalism schools. Hands don't go up, so uh, this is going to be a really brief review. So if you think about the economics of information, Anthony Downs has a great way to describe your world. Each of us has four information demands. Consumer, how do I get information about a product? Producer, how do I get information that makes my day job easier? Entertainment, how do I get information that's diverting for me? And voter, how do I get information that helps me be a better citizen? And in some ways, we're living in a golden age of those first three information demands. But the fourth information demands is subject to what uh, Anthony Downs called rational ignorance. Think about your decision to become informed about a candidate. You may really care about whether one candidate or another is elected, and getting more information may actually help you make a better decision from the perspective of your own preferences. But unless you're a Supreme Court justice, your vote is not going to determine who the president is. So if you think about the statistical impact of your vote, the expected value of becoming informed is negative because there's always an opportunity cost of your time. So most people remain rationally ignorant about most details in politics. Now at Stanford, I direct a journalism program as well as being a professor of communication. And I would be out of a job if there were not an express demand for public affairs information. So how in the world of rational ignorance do we still get these stories? I call it the three Ds, duty, diversion, and drama. A set of people believe they have a duty to become informed and active in politics. It's identity consumption. So I, I've always taken my two sons to vote with me. I don't say, we're about to determine who the president is when I go. I say, uh, this is part of what we do as citizens. And this is fandom, expression. I have a strong party ID. And so you become informed not out of an investment motive, but out of a consumption identity. Second is diversion. For some people, C-SPAN is as interesting as ESPN. Uh, those people get masters in public policy. They watch the uh, PBS News Hour. That's about 1% of the American populace. And third is diversion. Maybe I can't tell you the details of climate change, but I can tell you about packed emails or I can tell you about who's ahead or who's behind. I can tell you about scandal. So that's providing you information about politics, piggybacking off the entertainment demand. So when you think about the market for news writ broadly, things are going great in many respects on those first three information. It's the voter demand, that fourth information, that's a problem. That's the demand side. On the supply side, there are five incentives that lead to the creation of information. One is, I want to sell your attention to somebody, that's advertising. One is pay me, that's subscription. One is, I want to change how you think about the world, that is nonprofit. One is, I want your vote, that's partisan. And one is, I just like to talk, that's expression. And what we've been seeing over time in the United States, especially in the last 10 years, is a reweighting of those different incentives. If we were in the 1850s or 1860s, it would be the partisan incentive that would explain the generation of a lot of information. Starting in America in the 1870s, there were uh, high-speed presses, which were very costly but could generate a lot of papers at a low cost if you were able to travel down the average cost curve. So what you saw was the emergence of a commercial press that was objective or nonpartisan, not out of norms, but as a commercial product. People took the word Democrat or Republican out of their newspaper titles. They became independent. And then fast forward to, say, the 1990s. What you have is Fox News. Fox News is counter-programming against what I would call a liberal media bias. In my book, All the News That's Fit to Sell, I show how network news was focused on marginal viewers 
not average viewers. That would make sense, right? You're trying to figure, figure out the marginal viewer. The marginal viewer was a woman in her 30s. She was more valuable to advertisers. And so network news had a liberal uh, bias, bias in the sense of what topics would you tell stories about to get the marginal viewer. I found in the 1990s the topics that women were more interested in relative to men, especially women in their 30s, were uh, gun control, poverty, issues of families with children. If I told you those were my issues, you might say I'm a Democrat. And so network news was broadcasting uh, one part of the political spectrum. Fox News came in as counter-programming. Now in the world of the internet, fixed costs have gone down so radically that you are back in a partisan world where you're able to get your worldview replicated back to you at a low cost. So there are four demands, five incentives, and then how do you deal with investigative reporting? When I started to write the book, I started to interview journalists. I started to go to investigative reporters and editors' conferences, conventions. At IRE, they define investigative reporting as original content about issues of substantive uh, interest in the community that somebody wants to keep secret. So in economics, original content means fixed cost, sometimes very high fixed cost. If you look at the uh, stories that are submitted in prize competitions for investigative reporting, they often take, on average, six months. So that's pretty high fixed cost, several hundred thousand dollars. Of substantive issue interest to the community, that's a world of positive spillovers or positive externalities. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, high transaction cost, that's somebody trying to keep it secret. If you've ever tried to do a FOIA, and how many of you have done a FOIA? Okay, how many had the FOIA answered in 20 days? Okay, so uh, that's the statutory uh, requ uh, requirement, never happens. So why is it hard to get investigative stories told? They are told in the market. They're often told by larger news organizations. So if you look at the Pulitzer Prizes, they're often large news organizations that can spread the fixed cost across many different uh, consumers, subscribers. They're often told by nonprofits, by ProPublica, people whose uh, mission is having an impact. They're often told as product differentiation. In the world of the internet, price gets competed down to marginal costs. Marginal cost of one page view is zero. If you are telling a story that many other people are telling, if it has good substitutes, you can't charge for it. So what you try to do is develop product differentiation, offer a different take, and when you see people investigating, uh, investing in investigative reporting today, it's often about product differentiation. It's often about trying to provide something that would motivate people to subscribe. It's also often about morale. It's often, when I talk to people now in newsrooms, they say, we need to do something to show the people who work here that they still have a mission and that they're different. So when I tried to start studying this empirically, I collected data. I found that investigative reporters and editors had 15,000 how I got the story prize surveys. And I, had, I paid them to make PDFs, and they put it up on the internet. And then I was able to text mine those stories to talk about what they found, how much they cost. I also did case studies. And here's where I think the best evidence is for the externalities. We travel back in time, 1998, Washington's police uh, are shooting people at an alarming rate. Um, 1997, a DC police shot and killed 12 people. That's not a stat that is easy to find. Nobody police, at the time, police organizations did not say, and in their annual report, this is the number of people we have shot in the line of duty who have died. Nobody likes to talk about that. The Washington Post investigated it for a year how many people were being shot by DC police over time. It took them $400,000 worth of effort to answer that question. They published a series, and they had an interesting story to tell. It turned out their Washington at one point had, hi had to hire a large number of new police officers. The same time, they were using a new gun, the Glock, which had a hair trigger. So there was an interesting story about inexperienced police with technology that wasn't working well. And when they published that story, they won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. The DC police said, we need to change. They mandated 100,000 hours of training. They spent $4 million on changing what they were due. And in one year, 
the number of police, the number of people they shot and killed went from 12 to 4, and it declined even more the next year. So what I did as an economist, as an industrial organization economist, and say, I said, how can I put a dollar value on that? So if you think about eight statistical lives, it's not going to be controversial here, thankfully, to say their economists can put a value on a statistical life, right? If you've read the work of Kip Fiscusi, if you've read the work of other people, you know economists look at wage markets, they look at revealed preferences and regressions, they try to say, how much more would I have to pay you to accept a 1 in 10,000 risk of dying on the job this year? Turns out the answer is $920. So if we have 10,000 people who take that uh, gamble, we have $9.2 million in additional wages and one statistical death. That's the, how OMB uses uh, the value of a st statistical life in looking at regulations. So I took those eight lives that were saved by the Washington Post reporting, multiplied them by $9.2 million, the value of a statistical life, subtracted out the cost of the policy change, the training, things like that, and I found for each dollar invested by the Washington Post in their investigation, society in the first year of the policy change got about $140 in net policy benefits. But how does the world work? Nobody rolls out of bed in Washington and says, thank you, Washington Post, for lowering the probability I will be shot by a police officer today. There is no direct connection between the social value that's generated and what you can monetize. That is a positive externality. That is a positive spillover. The benefits are spread widely across the community by people who have never read or been an advertiser target of the Washington Post. So what that means is that investigative reporting is underprovided. There are some incentives to do it, but not the optimal incentives. Some of the other empirical findings I did where I looked at prize competitions for investigative reporting, I found that over time, the people who do the prize winning work have, are more likely to be large media organizations. New York Times, Washington Post. Those are the people who still have the resources and the audience to spread the cost of these investigations across many people. I also found a depressing fact that it used to be people who won the Pulitzers for investigative reporting were in their mid-30s. Now they're in their mid-40s. Why is that an issue? Because if you look within newsrooms today, you see a sort of hollowing out of people in their 30s. I've actually been writing recommendations of journalists who are 30, 32, so they can go to business school. I actually wrote one for somebody to come here. Go to business school, go to law school, because they see the low returns to reporting. So you have this bimodal distribution of people in the newsrooms, young people who are cheap but excited, and people in their 40s, uh, mid-40s, early 50s, who are highly experienced, and those are the folks who are winning the prizes now. I also found that when you look at investigative reporting, one person can make a huge difference. Uh, that sounds trite, maybe a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, but what I decided to do was actually follow the entire career of an investigative journalist. So I hired a Pulitzer Prize winner to investigate himself. Uh, his name was Pat Stiff. He won an investigative, uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for Public Service in North Carolina, describing uh, the political economy of hog waste, which is exciting if you live in North Carolina, uh, to think about the environmental damage done by that industry. And so I hired him, and what I found, I gave him the coding sheet that I used in the other parts of my book. He had done more than 300 investigations over 36 years of investigative reporting, and half of them involved, to, involved substantive policy change as a result. About half of them generated policy debate. About 40 of them resulted in individual impacts, people being fired, people resigning, and in 10% of his investigations, so in 31 of his investigations, North Carolina passed a new state law as a result of what he did. So when you talk about reporters, even an individual reporter, a highly skilled individual reporter, can have a substantial impact when he or she does something that changes public policy. There are a lot of dire numbers you could focus on in reporting, the disappearance of 40% of newspaper reporters since the financial collapse, but I'm actually optimistic for a couple reasons. Number one, I think there are some policy levers that can be used to support journalism. One of them is 
real implementation of the Freedom of Information Act. FOIA turned 50 in July. There was actually a new law passed to revitalize FOIA. How many of you knew that? So that's rational ignorance, right, in, uh, in practice. But there is the prospect that um, if that is uh, uh, put into effect, that can lower the cost of pulling uh, data out of the government. The government can also do R&D that would help support the development of tools for journalists in an area called computational journalism. In 2008, I put a, a request into NSF uh, for a project on computational journalism because I wanted to see what would the reaction be to reviewers. And it was bimodal. One set of reviewers said, public interest data mining, trying to use statistical techniques to discover stories is too hard. We'll never be able to do it. The other set of people said, this is trivial. We do it every day on the war on terror. We have funded great software at places like Palantir and elsewhere that helps us monitor people. And those scientists didn't see the irony between the fact that I know the government has great software to watch us, but what I was interested in was trying to develop R&D so that we could watch the government. Can, the end, can academia do research that helps journalists? Sure. Some of you have probably heard of the Panama Papers, uh, the discussion of offshore banking accounts. Uh, the data visualization software used by those reporters actually came from a digital humanities project at Stanford. At Stanford, the project was called the Republic of Letters. The research question was, who writes whom in the 1700s? And they developed this visualization software that showed the connections across intellectuals in the 1700s. They open sourced it, they put it out, and it was taken up by an Italian firm, commercialized, and that was the uh, data visualization uh, software that was used uh, in the Panama Papers. So the reason I'm hopeful in part is I think computational journalism can lower the cost of discovering stories with better use of data and algorithms. How, is, how could that be possible? If you look at the Pulitzer Prizes announced uh, this week, there's actually machine learning algorithm behind one of them. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution wanted to look at the question, can you get uh, found guilty of sexual harassment or sexual abuse in the workplace as a doctor and still be practicing as a doctor. They scraped the web of 50 states. They looked at all the medical societies which had released these cases. They had 100,000 cases and they couldn't read them all, but they developed a machine learning algorithm. They took a training set. They said, this looks like sexual harassment. This doesn't. Uh, those of you in econ, it's like writing a logit, right? A zero one predictor of whether the case is probably what you're interested in. And they used that to drop the number of cases they had to look at from 100,000 to 5,000. So I think it is the case that computational journalism can lower the cost of discovering stories. And doing investigative reporting is just like drilling for oil. If you can radically lower the cost, you will get more of it. Second thing is on the demand side. If you can tell stories in a more personalized or engaging way, that type of product differentiation is something that people would pay for. I think the Nirvana site would be something like a site that knows you as well as Amazon, that knows what you've read, that knows the dimensions of stories that you want. If you have that type of product differentiation, that's the type of thing that people would pay for. So I've been using the term computational journalism a lot. I think one easy way to define it is stories by, through, and about algorithms. Stories by algorithms, those are things that we now see in finance, in sports, those are stories actually written by software. Narrative Science out of Northwestern and Automated Insights, those are two firms that are now writing stories by algorithm. They've also pivoted, so they do a lot of corporate work too. Automated Insights says their goal, or Narrative Insights says their goal is, what we want to do is take a spreadsheet and make a story. Those of you who look at quarterly earnings reports, Associated Press now writes most of their quarterly earning reports by algorithm. So their story by algorithm, stories through algorithm, that's discovering the pattern, finding the story, and then stories about algorithms. Yesterday, um, ProPublica was a finalist for their work trying to figure out what algorithms both government and industry are using in trying to write uh, the story behind those algorithms. So. 
It's lunchtime. I'm an economist. I've got a monotone. I think that's about enough. So what I'm going to do now is trans. Uh, we'll go to the panel discussion, but I look forward to your questions. Uh, uh, Jay, uh, before we start the panel, I want to tell you uh, uh, briefly the background on how did we uh, uh, get to this uh, case study. So uh, Luigi uh, and I share this uh, passion, interest in the role of uh, not only an, uh, you know regulatory capture, questions of chronic capitalism and, and so, but the role that media uh, plays. Re- uh, Luigi wrote uh, some very important uh, uh, papers, research papers on the role that media plays in democracy, in uh, capitalism, when it comes to uh, special uh, interest groups. And two years ago, uh, we heard about the uh, media part. So uh, Luigi went to Paris and had lunch with uh, Edoui, and when he came back, he told me this is, the, this is a real thing. They found some uh, market solution for something very uh, important, and I have to admit, now is a good time to admit it, that I was a little bit uh, suspicious. And I told Luigi, you know, they are a startup, and we don't really know the financials, and you know, a lot of things can be uh, happening there in the background, how they get the money, from where they get the money. But anyway, uh, Luigi told me, you are always too pessimistic, guy, let's uh, look into it. So, uh, so I went to Paris, okay, and, and then uh, I, uh, I met uh, uh, Marie, and one of the first things she told me that really struck me is that although they are a private uh, uh, company, uh, uh, they publish their financial accounts uh, every, uh, every year. They're totally transparent about it, which is usually not the case uh, with media companies and specifically with the... Uh, and I looked at the numbers, and uh, I know how to read numbers and financials, and I said, well, something is uh, happening uh, uh, here which is uh, uh, different. So before we start, let me just uh, stress that uh, I don't speak French, nor read French, and the case was written uh, by my good friend and colleague uh, Doval Fon, who is uh, Haaretz editor in large uh, in, uh, in uh, Paris. He was the editor-in-chief of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Haaretz. And I wrote the, uh, the, the, the teaching note. So, uh, uh, um, Edoui, I'll start with you. So let's go back to uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008, when you are, uh, you are one year or two years after uh, leaving the post of uh, uh, the editor-in-chief, three. three years of uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Le Monde, one of the most important uh, uh, newspapers in, in, in France, and you decide that you want to found a new a media uh, company. So f- say a few words. Uh, why did you uh, quit your job in this important uh, newspaper? Why did you st- uh, decide that you want to found this uh, new newspaper? And then this crazy business model that you start, you, 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 yeah, you chose, which is start with a paywall. And I, let me remind everybody who doesn't remember uh, uh, this, uh, this period. So in 2006, 7, 8, it's all about advertising. You know, we conquer the world with advertising. This is how you raise money for new ventures, and you go with paywall. So, with we please. Yes. Okay. I, I must take this. No, you you have a okay. Line there. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, to Professor Zingales, Professor uh, Warnick, uh, Professor Hamilton, and also our colleague uh, Dov Alphon. We work together even of big investigation about. Uh, French mafia and Israeli corruption. <laughs> Media part and and uh, and Arabs uh, <laughs> <Arrest. laughs> together. Uh, how do you say? I, I do agree. It's uh, the the digital age. It's also a golden age for journalism, but it is also a battlefield. When I quit Le Monde in 2005, I quit because I lose a a battle about independence. Finally, uh, financial oligarchs, they they take this uh, big newspaper with a reputation of independence, of uh, loyalty to, to the public. 
with many private interests and they use this sort of influence of this uh, uh, newspaper of the French elites. elites. Uh, and uh, when we, in 2007, with Marie-Hélène, with François Bonnet, you got all the story and all the figures and all the results in this book. Let's specially realize for this event. <laughs> and uh, we, we want, in this battle, we want to defend tradition in our modernity. Uh, we, we, were, we want to to prove that the traditional model of journalism in public interest, journalism for the public, journalism for the truth, for the, for the, the way that the citizen can be free and self-governed, uh, we can win this battle even in a moment of crisis, economic, commercial, editorial, moral crisis that create weak journalism, uh, infotainment. Uh, and when we start and we invent Mediapart, Mediapart, to understand, in French is media à part, that means different media, and also media Part participative, that's participatory media. That's, that was the, the two signification of this uh, new world we invent. And when we create Mediapart, uh, the point about the economic model, you are right, Guy, we, we were alone. All people say they are foolish. It's, uh, there is no way information must free. There, at this time, there was no payroll, even in the big, big newspaper around the world. Uh, and what we want to buy this economic choice, in fact, it was a business model. And finally, we succeeded. And it's a success story also. But the, the economic model was linked to the professional editorial democratic battle. That was the question of value. The value. Uh, I don't know if it's the tradition here, but you know the theory of value, Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and so on. And you know this uh, point of exchange value, use value. And the difference, there is the battle of, about the surplus value. Okay? My point in uh, economy, my... <laughs> I, I create just a, a very small economic theory. If you are in the, the model of audience of free access, exchange value is zero. And if exchange value is zero, use value at the end is zero. That means democratic use of information used for all the common, for all of us. I think that this model of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 audience free access uh, and sponsored by advertising destroyed value of information and destroyed the, 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 this essential value that's democratic value. And that, that's the, that was the point of uh, the, this foolish story. We create Mediapart to, to link this democratic battle, editorial battle, to the, the economic model. And, and another point is, uh, and I heard Professor Hamilton, in the digital age, we, you cannot make information, quality information, serious reference, uh, media, like in the printed age. We, all the, the public, had access of many information, open information, communication, sometimes information, 
you it's not like before with uh, this this uh, object that's a newspaper printed it's a it's a closed object all the people they are linked to many horizontally in the uh, social network in the uh, uh, continuous flow media they learn many things and that's mean for me in the commercial point of view that you must return to the center of journalism our our logo was uh, designed uh, uh, 2.0 web 2.0 from an old old pictures from the 19th century that is the guy in the street say read my newspaper last information last edition uh, exclusive and so on and that's that's the description for me we we must in this time we we are obliged to create and you you give the word before original content by analysis by investigation by information that made sense explanation exclusive new different surprising and that's I mean for me that investigative journalism i defend during more than 40 years this journalism i, I make this this journalism in le monde against uh, many problems with the left right and so all the powers that's the, that's the that's our sadness <laughs> that's uh, it, it, that's our condition but uh, investigative journalism for me it's not now uh, a small part uh, a specialized part in journalism it's finally the center the the heart of our culture because we must say to the people come to my media you will find information you don't find uh, in other place and the second point is about opinion and it's a debate very important in united states now when we create media part i make reference and you will find them it's two 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 authors in the united states one is anna arendt it's uh, text in uh, uh, in the new york in uh, 1967 that's true fans politics and it's uh, very actual even in your debate here and you know you know you know the her reflections that i just quote just quote freedom of opinion is a fast non-less factual unless factual information is guaranteed and the facts themselves are not in dispute mm. she opposed truth of opinion and truth of facts the danger in the digital world and that's produced some politician like that it's that truth of opinion will be the winner and if there is only my opinion against your opinion my uh, faith against your faith my uh, uh, bias against your faith uh, against your bias my belief against your belief there is no common word to create a common word the discussion must be about this very true for facts this true for facts and that's a, that's for us a big challenge uh, true for opinion all can do it now you can take your blog you can go to the social network you can go to fox news and blah 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 even fake news alternative facts puff truth you know that and for us the battle is to and in sense it's a very it's a it's a very vital essential battle to put truth of facts at the earth of the debate and that's the origin of journalism and the second author you you know him he, he created the, the school of sociology in chicago it was journalist against 50 50 age of 50 it was robert ezra park robert ezra park he uh, 
uh, after journalism, very hard journalism, he, he, he go to study in Europe, in, in Strasbourg, it was German at this time. And he, his, his big work before university recruit him was, uh, he wrote it in German language, it was Masse in un publicum, the mass and the public. That's the, on our time you can say audience, mob, and public. And that's a very big tradition of debate, even John Dewey, even here in, in your country. That's, uh, we must create public. Audience, and that's the free model access, that's the advertising model, that's the entertainment model. Audience destroyed public, and for me destroyed the democratic conversation. It's the mob. It's all people in one, they don't discuss. They, they are angry, they are, they are in, only in opinion. And for me, that means we, we must return to the earth that Mediapart, there is two legs. The journal, that's our information, information, truth of facts. And there is the club, that's the participative, participatory area of our subscribers. They are against us, they criticize us, they approve us, but there is this debate. There's a sort of new ecosystem. We return, I think, I got conviction like you, like all people there, but I think that our job now, more than ever, is to find, to publish, to discover new information, and to battle for the credit of information, of this truth of facts. Okay, so, uh, so Edoui has been uh, a journalist for decades, but I want you to notice the influence of uh, Chicago. He's been here only two hours, and in, in, he, all, he started with an economic theory. <laughs> yes. Okay, so he theory already developed a uh, yeah, theory of uh, <laughs> uh, journalism, and, but this is not peer-reviewed yet, so yeah. we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll Okay, so, so before, we, before we go to the discussion on the, is uh, investigative journalism uh, a public good or not, and when is it a uh, public good or not, I, I would like to start, and we are in a business school, so I'd like to start with you, uh, uh, Marie uh, Helene, because as we know in every news organization we also need an adult to make sure that the revenues are bigger than the, the, than the costs. So can you describe uh, uh, to us uh, uh, briefly the major financial decisions uh, that you and your team had to take when you are founding a new uh, media organization, which is so unique, so different than what you have, and you have a lot of huge competitors, you, you very big uh, uh, competitors that probably no one wanted to see you, and you are going and you attacking the establishment, and you still, t and you need to raise money. So uh, from my own experience, founding a new media company is living from crisis to crisis. So can you go into details here? Uh, the first decision, <laughs> maybe it was uh, to invest uh, as a founder because, you know, when we launch Mediapart, we start try to convince bank investors and the people, we people to say we have a good, very good team for journalism. We have a good project. We want to have a newspaper with independence investigation and we believe we can succeed. We can find 50,000 people in France interested to buy this information. And nobody believes that. And they said, you are crazy, and we are not interested, and newspapers lose money, and it's a huge squeeze in the, in, the, in the press and media, so no chance. So we spent a lot of time to, to, to try to find phone, and we didn't find. So at least we say, OK. First, we have to put our money, so we, we, uh, we didn't have a lot, so we, we borrowed, we borrowed, we, we borrowed, we, we borrowed. Mm -hmm. and we, we, we collect the first million, and after that we say, okay, we invest one million, so would you like to help us for a democratic project, for a new newspaper, independence, no advertising, no subsidies, nothing else, just journalism and investigation, and we convince two investors, and we convince ourselves 
friends to help us, and we, we started to, to, to launch. So that was maybe the first decision, because we believe it can be successful, and uh, it's a first and editorial project, and the business model is not to maximize profit, is not to earn money, the business is, we think we still have a newspaper, it's, it's possible to have a newspaper independence without any advertising, just with the revenue for the subscribers, and it can be profitable, not to have a lot of profit, but just to be able to keep the independence of the newspaper. Okay, so uh, Edoui, when I, uh, so when you started out, uh, uh, Marie-Hélène mentioned in the first investors that got on board, and I already started teaching this, uh, this uh, case uh, here in, uh, in a booth, and I showed the, uh, so I showed the students two uh, facts. The first one is that some of your initial investors were actually part of the French elite, very powerful uh, players in the, in, uh, in, the, in the business world that have a lot of political uh, connection. And then I also point them to a fact that uh, uh, when uh, Dov asks you about one of the investors, which is a very powerful player that relies on a lot of regulation in, the, in, in France, you call him, uh, you said at that point in time, he was not yet part of the French oligarchy. And when you say French oligarchy, you don't mean it in a positive way. So can you just go into details how it is that on one hand you have player, uh, very powerful uh, uh, business players as your first investors, and on the other hand, uh, you know, you have to report about them and their friends, and you call them oligarchy. <laughs> first, my bad reputation in France. I am journalist for now 41 years. And one of the reasons of the crisis in Le Monde, when I, I was not a politic journalist in politics, a journalist, investigative, education problem first, and after that, security, police. And I make revelation about the state, about the president, about the Elysee Palace, about uh, also uh, the corruption, uh, the, the big, uh, I would say, délit d'initié. Délit d'initié. <laughs> that's... Inside. <laughs> Inside. Inside. Yes, yes. Inside in the market. It was a very big uh, economic affa affair. Yes. Insider Inside. trading. Inside we know trading. about insider trading. <laughs> insider trading. But it was, it was the first big affair of insider trading because it involved the Minister of Economy. Uh, uh, like, okay, I, I, I do all this story. And finally, because at this time Le Monde was independent, was controlled by the team of the redaction and so on, an accident, a crisis, put me in a situation of power. I, was the editor, uh, okay, a big, big boat, like, uh, okay. But the situation, they, and they <laughs> that was the reality. I think we must uh, discuss with uh, uh, all the diversity of the society, of the politics, of the economy. But we are independent. We are independent. And finally, the that was real. <laughs> they don't have, uh, uh, they don't uh, can uh, co corrupt or control me <laughs> at this time. That's that's the key also for me of the the, uh, the sh shadow story of the of the crisis of Le Monde. I I, I was a, a disorder for because, and that's a, a question of language in French and in English. We are not in a political way in France a liberal country. <laughs> That's the question, all the tradition you have, uh, the first amendment, the, the principle of the, the, the freedom of press, of the counter power, of the, my, my point of view, we are really a sort of a, a monarchy, a Republican monarchy, a sort of Bonapartism, Caesarism power. That's the, uh, I say that we are in the presidential election. And all the power, the economic power, the politics, they are very, very implicated. And the society was 
very uh, inured uh, the, the, the all the, the dynamics of the society ignored by the, 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 the this book. When we with Marie Helen, when we research money, we want to create this uh, this affair. I am a journalist. I don't think I will be a businessman. I need Marie Helen. <laughs> come from from uh, uh, she was in Pekin at this time. She she was in China. We okay. We make the business plan. We okay, and we make and. In my naivete, 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 uh, I think that there was, even in the French capitalism, liberal guys say, I am independent. We, you will not control even a word. You cannot make a phone call. You cannot, nothing, nothing. There is this is a red line. OK. But you, are, you agree, even in your competition, economic competition, you need loyal information, even about your concurrence, about your, OK, you need this competition. That's the, the reality of the society, democratic and also economic. OK, and you know I can do it. I prove it. You know, during five years, Le Monde was really profitable. And that was the biggest uh, 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 diffusion, uh, Distribution. Distribution. Circulation, Distribution. The, the good word, circulation uh, <laughs> for the monde uh, during this year. And we don't find, we don't find, uh, the two guys, finally, the two investors, they are very curious. One is a friend of Marie-Hélène, and the other guy was really involved in the, the gay movement, minority, battle about equality, and he was really in a liberal point of view. He was not. Your question. There is the, 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 the co-founders. There is these two investors. And there is a, a friendship society. Hey, Paul, I made a, a say, sort of way in apartment. Uh, I go there. We explain. Tupperware. Tupperware, Tupperware <laughs> meeting. <laughs> say, well, OK, it will be that. We, say, we explain Mediapart. Okay. All our friends, friends, the, the, one of the biggest uh, uh, investors in the, this French society, it's a, a very friend of uh, my young times, that's Muriel Mesguiche. Uh, she she worked in, uh, in uh, uh, clothes, uh, uh, textile, fashion, fashion. fashion, in fashion. And she, 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 she put, uh, OK, she is not uh, in any big business and so on. And at this time in 2007, the, the guys you speak to is Xavier Niel. It's the owner of Le Monde now. It was an outsider. And OK, he said, I put, it was very small money for him. But, but this guy, Xavier Niel, we, it, he is now a big uh, operator in the uh, uh, digital uh, and also uh, telef network, ne network telef telef telephone, telecommunication. We make the biggest, the more serious investigation about him. That was the only time during all the st short story of Mediapart I received uh, the coup de fil menaçant. Angry folk. <laughs> the, 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 the guy say, uh, 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 je vous enregistre, uh, I, 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 I record. I recording. <laughs> say, like a spy. Say, you do that? Yes. You are. It was very, very um, um, big pressure. OK, no, nothing. We, we do, we do. Uh, and the, the, the other guys you mentioned, that uh, they put. For them, it's like a uh, pourboire, uh, a, a, tip, a tip, like a tip, uh, 500 euros, uh, 5,000 5, euros, just uh, a tip. Why they do that at this time? They say, OK, it was very, the monde was not far for me. There was two, two, the two best investigative in economic world. In our team, that's Laurent Mauduit, one of the co-founders, and also Martin Orange, who 
she is very respected by all the economic people because uh, very serious in all the revelation about uh, uh, finance, about uh, the big uh, companies and so on. They put some money, but this society of France, it's, not, uh, it's, it's a society with the president. And who is the president? Finally, it's another friend. It's a mathematician, uh, a scholar, a, a professor, a researcher. And, and there are, in this uh, society of friends, there are 88, exactly. 88. 88. 88. And, OK, now, if we search, if, if, if we need, it's not the case, if we need money, I think all these people will don't go. <laughs> they put just, perhaps we will, we will see what's arrived. And finally, what's arrived, they don't control. We are independent. It's a success story. OK, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll soon move to, uh, to Jay to ask him what he, that he's in, uh, that what he has learned from reading the case uh, about uh, the dynamics, the economics dynamics uh, 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 here, but before we go there, can you, you know, uh, most people here are not familiar with the French uh, uh, media landscape and the relations between media and politics, media and business, and it has to lot to do with the success of the uh, media part. So can you, uh, both of you, describe uh, in a most direct way that you can do it, what is it, how does it work there? How does the uh, newspapers, uh, powerful newspapers in in France, uh, uh, what is the culture? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, in the, the Professor Hamilton books, he, there is the, this crisis that's, that's the, the, here in the United States, in France, it's the same. 2007, 2008. It's the time of the crisis. It's the time of the crisis. And, in, in fact, in France, the consequence is uh, all the, 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 the private media, uh, even the independent one, uh, were bought by uh, industrial, w which are outside of information industry. <laughs> uh, they, they take this media not to, 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 to give them a dynamism, but to make a situation of influence. Now, in France, the biggest uh, advertiser, the number one of the luxury industry, the more richest European man, that's Bernard Arnault, LVMH, you know all this. Uh, control, Vuitton and so on. Control, LVMH. LV, LVMH, excuse me, LVMH with a good accent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he controls uh, the more popular daily newspaper, that's Le Parisien, and the uh, only reference economic newspaper, that's Les Echos. And he is the first announced advertiser in all the media. That's a real conflict of interest. Uh, this He's connected to Niel also. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. P private <laughs> connection. <laughs> private <laughs> connection. <laughs> because Niel is, is uh, linked to, to, to his daughter. Yeah. And uh, they, they, uh, he, the grandson is a uh, very small, small world, economic world. But uh, I can't describe all uh, the, the, the rightist uh, daily uh, newspaper, that's Le Figaro in France, is controlled by uh, an arm dealer linked to the state command. That's Dassault, plane for the war and so on. OK. Rafale. Excuse? Rafale and so on. <laughs> OK. And uh, oh, you say Niel, but I can say also, uh, also Mr. Drahi. That's guys from uh, the, the, uh, the, the new world of uh, communication. And they control Le Monde, Libération, L'Express, Le Nouvel Observateur. That's all, all the, that's what I point when I say we, we don't have 
a liberal culture. I think democracy is not institution, it's a culture. And that's the challenge for you now, uh, if I see on the other side <laughs> the situation, uh, on the side of the Atlantic Ocean, the situation in the United States. The, our, the, the, the society, the, the, the democratic culture reacts when there is brutalization, privatization, uh, corruption, and uh, uh, nepotism, and so on. How would they, how would they react? Uh, and uh, for me, uh, in France, this the situation is really a disaster. But there is a good news. The success of Mediapart is not an, an alone success. In fact, we give courage to other journalists. To, they, they, they make battle where they are. There is good journalists in all the media. And finally, they say, OK, you say Mediapart, it's good. It's our ident identity. We are proud of that. Now, some of our investigations are linked to big uh, uh, TV magazine like, uh, of investigation. And they, they take our investigation and they make event with our information. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the also what we create. I don't know if if in the United States, that's a question for you. <laughs> if, because in your book, you, you demonstrate that it's, it's non-profit. We publish all many investigations of ProPublica in, uh, in Mediapart. And uh, you can find some of our articles are translated in English uh, uh, on Mediapart and also in Spanish. Uh, but you... you you mentioned that in the United States at this time, the, the consequence of the crisis is that uh, the biggest investigation are by non-profit organization that sponsors online, online, investigation. online investigation that uh, they, they, they uh, uh, sponsor that. My question is, and I think for me, perhaps the, the reply is, is yes. It, is there a place in the United States for a sort of pure model like Mediapart? No advertising, no government subsidies, no uh, uh, private, uh, uh, because we, we, we reduce the part of the, the, the private uh, 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 investors. We, we, we bought them. Uh, with the, this tradition of investigative, the part of separatory play, uh, where we are, the club, uh, and with this model, which is not only an economic model, by the economic model, by uh, the situation only our readers can buy us, <laughs> only, uh, that's, uh, the only support is the subscribers, and and you subscribe for uh, uh, democratic in journalism in public, uh, uh, in public interest. Uh, my question is, is there a place in the United States for uh, a pure model like, like uh, Mediapart? Because I don't, the question of your case study, and you, even your question about France, about the situation, the question <laughs> is, is Mediapart is a, a French accident, or is Mediapart is a universal laboratory? Uh, Professor Zingales, in this article yesterday in ProMarket, say we are a ray of hope for journalism <laughs> in all the world. It's too much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But uh, it's too much. My question is, uh, our. We, we, we create a sort of purist, come on, the pure, pure, pure model, that's what I say, pure model. Uh, and finally, it's work. And finally, it's work. Whether you mention it in, in a pro market, uh, the, 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 the proportion of result of Mediapart, that's a curiosity for us. And that's a surprise. And the big question is what we will do with that. Mediapart, it's uh, uh, 18. 17% of net result in the media industry. <laughs> they, you don't find this sort of situation. 
and, and, and the increase of the, the subscribers of the result is regular, 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 regular. Is, is it a French exception? Or is it possible to replicate this model? Okay, so thank you for mentioning. By the way, pro market is our, is our that uh, Ed we talked, is our uh, blog, and I like to hear it in a French accent. Pro market sounds great in French. So Jay, this is your, this is where you have to come in and answer and answer the we questions. Can we replicate it? Can we do it in the United States? You read the case. You read my teaching notes, and you should have uh, formed some idea about that. Yeah. So um, I think the great answer is this is microeconomics come alive because I think that if you look at an economic framework of what you've done, first of all. You as the founders were in your late 40s, mid 50s. Those are folks who have human capital, who cared about traditional journalism. Those are the folks who are still winning the investigative reports, reporting prizes today. People who are willing to fund you, the friends and those investors. Uh, we have those people here too in the United States. Um, if you think about um, who owns the media in the United States in the 1980s, the Two industries where family or individual ownership was predominant were sports franchises and media outlets, because in both of them you got a sort of psychic income, a civic return for doing that. Um, that was from a journal Political Economy article from Dem Sets and Lane. So there's something different about contributing or owning to a media outlet. It gives you some sort of psychic uh, return. The cost of doing that has dropped dramatically uh, because the profitability of the media has dropped dramatically. So. Washington Post, Boston Globe, Minneapolis uh, Star Tribune are all owned by billionaires now uh, because they can afford to, to uh, exercise that civic engagement. Your bet on subscription was brilliant. If you look at advertising, media economists have always said advertising has some biases in it. One is uh, advertisers don't care the utility you derive, just whether you watched it, whether you were exposed. And advertising is biased against high cost content because, again, they just want you to watch. And so things that are high cost, like public affairs, don't fare well in advertising markets. Advertising also is biased against intensely held preferences. Again, did you just watch it or not? So the nice thing that you were doing about subscription is you were making a bet about whether there were enough people that could cover the low cost, relatively low cost, in a digital age of starting a media outlet. You couldn't have done this in a world of printing presses, yes. yeah. but you, you can do it in this world. Could it be replicated here? Here's a thing that might be a problem. You were living in a spatial competition model where the fact that the other media were compromised left a whole set of stories that you could tell. And one of the difficulties of investigative reporting is you can't copyright facts. So in the US, when you do a story, it's immediately repurposed by other people. But initially, in some of your investigations, they weren't being repurposed by the other people because the other people didn't want to say those things. And they were actually saying that you were wrong. So there was a nice thing about uh, the collusion meant that there was a whole set of stories that you could tell because you had a different incentive. Whether that would work in the United States, it's interesting because we have the New York Times, we have the Washington Post. Those are for-profit entities, but if I ask you the, the family behind the New York Times, you would say the Salzburgers. If I say who's behind the Washington Post, you would say Jeff Bezos. That means those folks get some civic or psychic return. So they can tell those stories. So the, it's an empirical question about whether there are major significant untold stories that the New York Times and Washington Post don't tell. A separate thing is you provide an excludable good, right? If people can't see it unless they go into your story, uh, if unless they have subscribed. What some people are trying to do is call it not a subscription, but a membership, right? Because a membership also makes it feel like you're part of a community. And so again, you're getting people to give money not just to get the excludable good, but also to get the psychic return of, of being a member. Now, when economists get together, they say, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Mm -hmm. So if I actually knew the answer to your question, I wouldn't be in this chair, I would be in that chair. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I think those are a couple of empirical questions. Are there stories, 
are those stories that you're telling would the Washington Post, New York Times, Seattle Times, would they be telling those stories? So is that there? But I think that we are seeing more people in the US starting subscription-based information, like there's one called The Information. So if any of you are interested in media economics, that's something that has a discounted student subscription. There are now sports writers who have subscription-based things. So I personally think, and that's the strategy the New York Times is betting on, subscription rather than advertising for all of those, all of those reasons. So I'm glad you made the bet. And essentially what you're doing in the old days, we used to free ride off of a family, the Sulzbergers, the Grams. You've expanded the number of people we're free riding off of. You, you now have 88 people that people in France can free ride off of because they've been willing to invest and do well and do good at the same time. So if you look at the, uh, if you look at the chart, that, uh, uh, that the growth in subscriptions here, you will see that there are two instances where it starts growing very fast. This is when uh, Media Park broke the story of uh, Kiyosak, the uh, finance minister, the economics minister, and then the Betancourt. Uh, and actually what Jay is saying uh, is that had uh, French media would automatically follow up on your stories, and said, well, there, you know, this is a good story. You cannot copyright facts. We are also going to write about the uh, tax issues of uh, Kuzak or uh, Beten of uh, the story that actually you won't be able to be so successful. I'm, no, vas-y, 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 vas-y. Mais vas-y, tu allais commencer. Je t'en prie, je t'en prie. No, I just want to say, uh, now it should be, but at that time it was not, because for Kuzak affair, uh, for three months, it was a very huge battle because uh, he said no, and and uh, all the the press said okay. He said no, so you are you you are uh, you are fake news. Yeah, you are fake news. But follow. Yeah. No, <laughs> uh, your question is how we can how it's now. Uh, I, I will demonstrate by an example. Yeah, I think uh, the, our potentiality of growth. Uh, is uh, really, uh, really uh, in, in not in the back, but <laughs> in the future. Uh, now, you say in this booklet, they say uh, uh, 130,000 uh, at the end of December. Now we are at 140,000. Just now, with all the debate, all the revelation, all the conflict about the presidential, the electoral campaign. An example. There is, in France, a very sort of curiosity, like Mediapart, that's le canard enchaîné. Le canard enchaîné, it's, uh, it was created du during the First World War against uh, censorship during the war in uh, anarchist, libertar, lib Liber libertar libertarian. libertarian, libertarian. That's uh, the tradition. The, tra uh, the tradition I I in France. When we now, it's very uh, rich. Eight pages, no advertising, great circulation, m a lot of money, a lot of money. When I was young in the seventies, it was all investigation was in Le Canard Enchaîné. When I arrive in Le Monde, I say, okay. Le Monde, you make comments about investigation of Le Canard Enchaîné. No, it's not good. We must make our investigation. Politicians and uh, all the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the advisors and all the people with the power, sometimes they told to the direction of Le Monde and even to myself, I say, what Plenel is doing? There is a place for investigation, like there is a place for prostitution, you know? <laughs> there is a place. It's Le Canard Enchaîné. In Le Monde, you make comment about this uh, bad thing. And I do know, I say, we, we are journalists, uh, and we make the investigation. I, I, why I t tell you this story? When we launched the Cahuzac Affair, it's it was the revelation that the Minister of Budget of, was himself a tax frauder with an illegal Swiss account. And it was just at the beginning of the Hollande presidency. And it was three, four months of battle 
against all the media. Real battle. Huh? And finally, because we win, <laughs> and the guy must uh, say, OK, it's the truth, because the police, the justice, they proved uh, what we, we, we have published. And uh, it was a very, a very big terremoto, a big event, because earthquake, because the, 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 the President Hollande created what we call the parquet financier, the, 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 the financial prosecutor that don't exist before in France. And that's the, the key of all the affairs now in France, even the Fillon affair, that that's the financial prosecutor. That was a creation because of the Cahuzac affair, because. And, and where is that? Just, and that's a demonstration that investigation help policy and help public. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. Rob, Rob, Robert Park, that's a, yeah. a, a journalist with uh, uh, information, is, uh, is a better reform that uh, commentary, got, uh, etc. And what I say, it's that kind of enchaîner what's against us, to which to co I, I, they, they become conformist, mainstream, uh, linked to their information in the state, and they don't want the information of Mediapart. It was uh, now, it was uh, four years ago. The Fillon affair, finally, that was le canard enchaîné. But that was le canard enchaîné in a, uh, like a puzzle. The puzzle that was Mediapart. Because two years before, we published a big investigation. There was not the Fillon case. F Fillon is the rightest candidate to the presidency in France now. And we published a big investigation about the nepotism uh, in the parliament in France. That you can do that, cannot do that in the Congress, you cannot do that in the US Congress, you cannot do that in the European Parliament, but in France, uh, 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 a deputy, uh, uh, a congressman can uh, use uh, his wife, uh, his children. Where's the public money? It's no control. We publish all this story. The Canard Enchaîné, they find the good guy at the good moment, that was Mr. Fillon. But what's right? It's the revelation of Le Canard Enchaîné that was a profit for us. <laughs> because the, the article more linked, uh, partagé, uh, shared, more shared in all the web, it was this article two years ago. The people understand that the, the big story that made sense, not only one man, but the question of the nepotism was media part. And that's the reason. And now I think that that's the, the price of the, the first to, to have to get the, the, good, the good idea, the good model. I think this competition is a good, good point for us. It's a good point for us, and that's, don't, that, that, that's profit to media part. Because, w in fact, it's well, sort of irony, auto-irony. There is a, an image, a popular image, like Mediapart, with no advertising, uh, young journalists, uh, independent, uh, very uh, strong independence, is sort of Robin Hood of journalism. <coughs> uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's the image. Okay, so before we take uh, questions from the audience, I'd like to ask you one. You, you mentioned shares, uh, Facebook shares, social network uh, shares. And so uh, last year we had here as a guest at the Stigler Center, uh, the departing editor-in-chief of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger. And uh, so I asked him, you know, look at media part, look at the world is going, look at your losses that you're accumulating. It's time to erect a paywall so The Guardian can be a viable, uh, viable business. And he said, no, we, are, we will not have a paywall because if we want to influence the world, if we want to educate the world, you know, you have to reach masses of millions of people. And the question is, you know, you, you have 140,000 uh, people. It's a very strict paywall. You, there are no, there is no, like in the New York Times or other publications, freemium. You have to pay from the first article that you read in the, so can you still be fully uh, very influential, although you reach only 160,000 people in a country which is, has population of uh, 60 million people? 67. 67, 
there is, when I say uh, uh, 140,000 subscribers, you must compare to the real uh, 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 clients who pay for Le Monde, Le Figaro, or Liberation. The, the three generalists, politics, uh, daily, printed, and also on the web newspaper in France. Liberation, digital edition, uh, paper, by post, in the street, it's around 50,000. We are near uh, trois fois plus, uh, three, uh, three, three, three times. Le Monde, the real pa paper, digital, that is really paid, it's 210,000. We are more than an half. I am good in English, more than an half, okay? And that's the real of the market. And we don't, we have not government subsidies because the, the, the biggest scandal for me in France, it's in this crisis, this old press, even the more riches with the big uh, billionaires with the, who, who buy the, this newspaper, they, 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 they receive from the state uh, Le Monde, Le Figaro, Les Echos, more than 10 million by year. If they don't receive this money, the crisis, the reality of the market will be there for them. <laughs> and, the, the, and this big owner, they, they don't make a, a profitable market. They will be, they will be in crisis. Uh, that's, that's the first point. The second point, you, you mentioned it in your case study, Mediapart, it's these this figures, okay. But you, in, on the social network, Mediapart, it's near two million followers on Twitter. The small Mediapart, two million. Uh, in uh, Facebook, it's not far from one million. There is a, a big gap of popularity, audience, it's the audience, in fact, and the public. And that's the reason I am not anxious for the future. Uh, uh, there, there, is a, there is a big potential. Because we are, we must subscribe to read Mediapart, but go on Mediapart after this meeting. You can read all the, the abstract and the resume of our information. We can, you can know what we reveal. And you go on the club with all the discussion, it's free access. Because it's the contribution of our readers. We, we don't, we don't, uh, uh, we'll take money from our readers. <laughs> the, it's, there is, for me, uh, uh, in a digital world, you, you, our model, it's we, we build a, pub, a public with the subscri subscription, but we are linked with this. Uh, that's, in, English is, uh, is a very good language to understand that. Leak and leak. <laughs> leak, the leak, is the investigative journalism, the link, the content, and link. It's the horizontal world, the spread. And now the, the reputation we, we, we have in the, the, uh, the, the French world, in fact, but also <laughs> now in uh, Chicago for, <laughs> for, for, one, for, for two hours, uh, it's, it's linked to, to this digital world. And you are right. N not only the structure of the, the cost, the paper, the, the, the impression, the distribution, but also the digital world was our chance. And also, uh, last point, uh, if you are, yes, you have a strict uh, paywall, but if you are a subscriber, you can share all the articles with uh, every people you want without any limits. So some of the sub subscribers has maybe 300 friends, and if they find something interesting, they send the article to 300 friends. You love yes. one article, you send the article to 200 we, friends. We know that because uh, we, can, we can say how many articles have been shared. So. And the friend read this article and after that, yeah, oh, it's good, I want to go. Ah, you must pay. We, the, our event 
all our marketing is a genuine marketing <laughs> from the, our experience. Uh, we organize now once a week, each Wednesday, a public event that's uh, like a television debate, even in the campaign, the uh, candidates come and debate about the Europe, about the, uh, all the, the questions. Okay. But that is free access on entonnoir, entonnoir, how do you say entonnoir? Funnel. Funnel. <laughs> okay. okay, it's free access. You go and, and that's create because after it's on our YouTube channel, it's always in free access and we play. And the people go there and they don't subscribe at this moment, but finally they subscribe. That's the, the uh, there is no, I don't like this word paywall. It's not a wall. It's a, a membrane, it's a, a very... Porosité. Porosité in French. Permeable. Yes, it's permeable. Well, okay. Okay, so uh, before I ask it, we who's going to be uh, who's going to win the uh, French election, let's hear some uh, <laughs> questions from the audience. No, we we we, we, the f we are not all to, for the future, <laughs> only the present. Only okay. the present. Yes, please. So building on this topic of you know economic value Just a second. Let's make sure that yeah, you can be heard. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. So building on this topic of economic value versus social value. What are some of the metrics that you guys use to evaluate how successful you are, uh, you know, beyond just the subscriber revenue and profits? And how does that influence perhaps how you decide which stories to cover and which not? Because maybe some stories are not going to be as interesting to your reader base, but to society as a whole, they may be interesting. We don't work like that. We decide only in our journalistic point of view. We, we, we don't uh, 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 ask many questions to our readers because we have nothing to sell to our readers, only our contents. And our contents, it's our professional, democratic reflections. Uh, what is in public interest? Is it a verification, a good verification, a good story? How do you, do you, uh, 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 what is the, the, la mise en scène, the, the, the scenario? How do you, do you push this story? And uh, after that, because we are a participative, participatory media, we, we, we saw the reactions. <laughs> we saw the discussion. Uh, we, we, we see uh, 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 if there is a problem, if there is a, a mis misunderstanding. Uh, we, we, we can see that in the real world. That's a virtual world, but that's a reality. And, and for me, our, another chance of the, 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 the digital journalism is we are not uh, a part than our public. If we make a mistake, we must explain. Uh, you know, articles in Mediapart, there is uh, many, uh, many speci specific objects we invent. There is what we call a black box. If uh, we got uh, uh, deontologic deontological, that's the same, deontological problem about this article, if there is anonymous sources, as there is a, a, perhaps a question of conflict of interest, we explain. We explain. If there is a contestation of the article, people with a letter, with an, uh, a lawyer, uh, I, I don't do agree, uh, it's a defamation, it's a, etc. We link in the paper, it's 10 years, 10 days, because 10 days, two weeks after, in other place, in the newspaper, the printed newspaper. In media part, you can find this letter linked to the article on what we call uh, uh, space that's prolongate, prolongate, prolongé, yeah. the prolongation of the article. Okay, there, there is many way to, to organize the discussion about journalism. But journalism, we, we, don't, we work not like a commercial way, it's only our work and how do we, you know, the, I, I spoke before about uh, what we do with Dove Alphon and Aaretz. 
For us in France, it's a, it's a criminal story about a great, great uh, criminal uh, uh, speculation about, uh, I would say, car CO2, le carbon. Uh, carbon dioxide, yes. There, is, there was a, a sort of market about uh, the, the right to pollute with the... Ca okay, and there was, a, uh, there was a break for the, the tax and the real criminal mafia, they go there. You, you don't have to kill a guy to take money in a bank, but it's bet, best report, best report, best report. Okay, that was our story. And when we discuss with the Valfon, you, we think, we, we found that there is a link in these people to the actual prime minister in Israel, Mr. Netanyahu. <laughs> and that means a new agenda. <laughs> the, your first agenda, it's like a well, criminal, very, there, is a, there is many money, there is five uh, uh, assassinats, uh, five, F five murders and uh, okay, but the second story, and that's not the same, uh, the same way to 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 tell the, the story to to our readers with the arrests is the political consequence of this story. Uh, we that's the our, our way to to work. Uh, only a debate, a professional, a collective debate. I think in journalism, I think. Uh, and that's, that's a very important point. It's not an individual profession for me. It's not an individual adventure. The first guy to correct you, to verify, it's your colleague. <laughs> and we work in this horizontal, uh, th there is a, the, our uh, uh, dire editorial director, François Bonnet, his co-founder, uh, explain, explain all the, our way to, to function. But we have to end. Uh, yeah, okay. Unfortunately, we have to close because uh, uh, the students have to go to class. And, but, uh, and I am, let I me am, thank you. Uh, I, am too, uh, I, I speak too too long, no, no, but no, I, no. I just want to sh share to, with you uh, a sentence that's uh, about investigative journalism. It's a gift for you because <laughs> your book is very marvelous. And it's a, uh, I, I, I met a, a citizen of Burkina Faso. It's a country in uh, West Africa. There was a, 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 pub a citizen uprising uh, against the, 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 uh, the, the, the president. He is now in exile, Blaise uh, Compaoré. It was a, a big movement of the citizen. The, 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 the name of the movement in France, does, that was uh, Le Ballet Citoyen. In my broom citizen, Broom citizen is a good translation. <laughs> Ballet, broom, broom citizen. And we discuss about uh, journalists and the relationship with journalism and society. Because there is also bad journalism. There is also journalism of propaganda, journalism with uh, corruption and so on. And this sentence with a great humor. The journalist starts the air Le lièvre, it's a good pronunciation. Yeah. The air, air, air. It's belong to the public to catch it. Le journaliste lève le lièvre. C'est à la société de l'attraper. You all understand my, or my English is too bad? No, no. 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 Okay. <laughs> Thank That's you the very question. Much. <laughs>